All right, great. Well, hey, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, this is Patrick from the Poison Pen Bookstore in Scottsdale, Arizona. Uh, thanks for tuning in to another of our virtual events. And this afternoon, we have Kate Kavari joining us. She's going to be talking about her books, focusing on the brand new book, A Botanist's Guide to Flowers and Fatality. Let me see if I can hold this right. I always get confused. Is that right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, beautiful cover. And Kate very kindly signed a batch of books for us. There we go. Uh, with a cool bookmark as well. Um, I'll put a link uh, in the comments field if you'd like to buy one of our signed copies. And we also have copies of her earlier book. Um, and if you have if you have questions for Kate, go ahead and put them in and Barbara will bring me back on screen and I would be happy to ask any of them. So Barbara, over to you. Thank you very much, Patrick. Kate, how nice to see you again. We had the pleasure of talking to Kate when A Botanist's Guide to Parties and Poisons published. Now, I have to say, Kate, this is A Botanist's Guide to Flowers and Fatality. I'm not sure how much longevity you've got for this kind of a title for event, or are you going to start running into problems? Um, I don't know. I really, I, I'm a sucker for an alliteration, so I am, I'm really hoping we can figure it out. We've been working on um, the title and cover art for the third mystery, which comes out next year. And we've been, you know, playing with some words, trying to figure out how to make the alliteration keep working, but I love it. So I'm happy to, I'm happy to work on it. Oh, no, I like alliteration too. I just didn't think there's an infinite life. You know? The other thing that's interesting too, is that mystery titles as a general rule, crime novels like short titles. And, um, and this is a fairly long one, uh, but it's a mouthful. This is that um, you get to have these really lovely cover designs to go with it. And the title, you know, is part of it. And since our focus here to a large part is in fact on herbs and flowers and, you know, flora, um, it seems to work really well. So Kate, okay, what got you interested in, you know, the whole sort of poison world, the whole herbal, because a lot of it's actually a good world. A lot of it's a healing world. Yeah, that's definitely something that I've I've learned through um, researching the second book and uh, getting the third book ready in particular is that anything um, poisonous is actually probably also a medicine and vice versa. So you have too much of anything and it's going to hurt you. You have just the right amount and you'll be fine. Um, but I, I got interested just because I love gardening. I love plants. Um, I uh, when I first got married and we got our first apartment, our entire living room was chock full of plants. And now we have a house and it's still chock full of plants. Um, so we have like a jungle room, living room. My office is full of plants, but I just think that they are fascinating, but like quietly fascinating. Um, and it's, it's even cooler that all of these plants that exist, um, you know, across time and cultures are, have been used as medicine, but also as poison. So, mm -hmm. but, but you're absolutely right. It's really learning to administer to the quantities. I mean, digitalis is a good thing. If you mm -hmm. have a weak card, it can stimulate it. And it's a fatal thing if you get too much of it. And that is true with an astonishing amount. Um, and, you know, there, I shouldn't even bring this up in this particular climate, but there have been things like Poldark. If anybody remembers watching Poldark, there's a whole mm -hmm. thing about abortifacients or fashions, however you pronounce that word. Um, you know, where plants were used um, for various purposes that, you know, today we use other drugs for, but could mm -hmm. be powerful. Um, you should read Lisa C.'s new book that just came out this week, uh, Lady Tan and Her Circle of Women. Because, were there poisons in it? Well, there is, there's the whole plant and poison thing. Yeah, absolutely. And the other, the other, you know, kind of, key element of your books is how difficult it was for women to, um, you know, practice any sort of um, medical or, or uh, pharmaceutical profession, in your case, the 1920s, in her case, we're back in the Tang Dynasty in the 15th century. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it was considered kind of a male province, but the truth is women had generally been better at all of this over the centuries, if you look at it, or if not better at it, at least more familiar with it. Maybe that would be a, a fairer statement. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, for, for centuries, it was 
uh, you know, like the, I don't know what they call them, you know, like the witch woman that you go to and she solves your problem with herbs. And um, I feel like that, that's also kind of why out of all of the sciences, I feel like botany was kind of not, not welcoming. I wouldn't call it welcoming, but I would say more accepted as a, an interest for, you know, gentle women um, going, going into the 20th century, you know, like women in general, but, um, yeah, it's because it's plants and plants are pretty and they thought that, okay, well, that's fine. If, if the girl wants to play with flowers, then that's fine. But really what they were doing was building catalogs of knowledge about what plants could do. But, you know, it was part of, um, women's trainings when running households, especially, mm -hmm. you know, large ones, but I mean, back for forever, um, women were, were trained to look after the people in their household and administer medicines and so forth to them. There was, you know, the still room. Um, I know one of the Jane Austen mysteries that Stephanie Barron wrote is called Jill, uh, Jane and the Still Room Maid, um, because, you know, this is a place where women concocted not just not just medicines, but also, you know, um, household products, you know, cleaning mm -hmm. products and, you know, hygienic products and all that other sort of stuff. But it was, it was a mostly a female role. Um, I wonder if that's where the notion of uh, poison being like the province of female murderers came from, uh, because they would know, they would have all of that knowledge and they have access then to like give it to people. I think uh, it's true. And, you know, let's remember that Agatha Christie, for example, you know, her work was as um, in pharmacology in the war. So poisons are what she did. Ellis Peters in her wonderful Brother Cadvale medieval series. She was also a person who, um, like Christie, worked in pharmacology in the war. Hilariously, Dorothy Sayers, who, who didn't work in pharmacology, got her poison wrong in uh, the only book she used in which poison was the murder weapon. I'm oh, going to have to go back and find that one. I love I love the Daisy Dalrymple series. They're so cute. I'm going to have to go back and find the poison. Find the, I'll, I'll try to, it'll come to me in a minute. But anyway, um, it, it revolves around poison mushrooms and she got the mushroom wrong. Her, her <laughs> mycology was wrong. Um, but then, as I say, she was an academic that hadn't actually worked in, in that field. So Saffron, um, I think is a really interesting woman. Is she somebody that you, have you modeled her on somebody or is she your own creation? Um, she's definitely my own creation. And I think that's only because when I started writing these books, I was, I was writing them for fun. I never written a book. I had, I didn't plan on doing anything with this project. I was just like, can I write a mystery? And I just started writing. Um, and so I didn't have like the education to, to be able to model her after anybody. And it's only really in the past, you know, couple years trying to get the books published and doing more research that I'm realizing that like, she was one of like legion women in botany, um, even in the 1920s. Um, but I mean, at, at Saffron's particular university, there's a reason why she is the only woman which has gone over in book one. And it's because her boss was a misogynistic jerk. So no woman wanted to work there, um, but she is one of many. So if I had known that at the time, I probably would have um, tried to find a more specific person to model her after. But um, I kind of like that she's just a, a new creation um, as well, because it, I feel like there's a little bit more pressure to bring in more details of, like, you know, whoever you're modeling um, off, you know, their life and trying to be true to that person. And I can just make, make self run up entirely this way. It's pretty hard for women to, you know, be accepted in professional circles. And I'm trying to think, I wanted to say it was Gillian Cantor, but I'm trying to remember who it was because I did an event with her. Anyway, her book was about a woman who was very interested and it might've been, in relation to um, the double helix, there was a woman who was part mm -hmm. of the um, the sort of unsung heroine of the Crick and Watson double helix discovery, and they they used a lot of her science uh, in order to, in fact, you know, create the double helix model, and she was able to be accepted and do a lot of her work in France, but the British had a much 
more chauvinistic attitude about women in science. And so, you know, she didn't get the credit and the respect she deserves. So, you know, it, it sort of makes sense to me that in 1920s London, that it would be difficult for Saffer and Eversley to, to have uh, an entree and be respected as part of this faculty that she, you know, where she's engaged. Exactly, exactly. And I think the, the thing that I'm realizing is that there were many women in the workforce after the war, obviously, they were kind of trickling out, but there was a lot of women who wanted to stay um, and they, they fought for it and they stayed. But like you said, they, they didn't get the recognition and the respect. So we had women in all different kinds of fields doing all different kinds of things, but you will not find their name in history books. You will find them as a, as a footnote, if even that, a lot of times. And there were well-respected women who published and, and got some recognition, but for every one of those, how many hundreds never, like we'll never know that they were scientists and That's what they true. discovered. Yep. So you're at University College in London, which is a real place. And um, Saffron Eversley, whom we're talking about here, is a, quote, research assistant. Um, so tell us, because a lot of people may not have read A Botanist's Guide to Parties and Poisons. You want to go back and kind of root? Oh, there's Patrick being helpful. It was Marie Benedict. Thank you. And her hidden genius was the one that wrote about um, the, the whole DNA the whole double helix thing. Thank you, Patrick. <laughs> See, that's one thing that happens when you get as old as I am. You have some trouble remembering names. So the chat feature on Zoom is wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> it's very helpful. It's very helpful. They can they can go look it up and remind me. So we can we can you know get that information out there. I love that book, by the way, Her Hidden Genius. I don't know if you've read it, but you might want to think about it in terms of what your own, you know, not to copy it, but just because the situations are similar. Yeah, for sure. I love I love women scientists, fictional and non-fictional. Anyway, back to University College and Saffron sure. University and a botanist guide to parties and poisons. How do we meet Saffron? So we meet Saffron as she is um, entering a dinner party she really doesn't want to go to um, because her colleagues will be there and she needs to network and she doesn't want to because they don't like her. And she doesn't really like them all that much. Um, so she's going and at this dinner party, um, there is a expedition that is going to take place where a bunch of her colleagues are going to the Amazon rainforest to do research. Um, she is not going and she's bummed, but everyone, everyone is there to celebrate this. And the man who's going to lead the expedition, his wife collapses. And um, later they find out from the police that she's been poisoned. So Saffron and a, and a handful of other party guests become suspects, including Saffron's mentor and like kind of pseudo father figure at the university, Dr. Maxwell. Um, he catches most of the blame. And so she is eager to take him, take him out of the picture and say like, obviously he's not the bad guy. And she does this by investigating who poisoned Mrs. Henry and why by herself. Um, and so we meet her through that. We meet um, her reluctant co-sleuth, Alexander Ashton, who is also a love interest. Um, and they spend the book causing, maybe not causing mischief, making mischief as they, uh, as they go through uh, gardens and greenhouses trying to find the answer to who poisoned Mrs. Henry. Right. And there's an act of real personal bravery, which we won't discuss any further. But uh, I, thought, I thought that was a really, um, a really courageous thing for you to do in that in that book. Um, it makes it an exciting. Or, or stupid. That's the question. No, it wasn't stupid at all. I think, you know, um, it's it's easy to make some historical fiction, particularly for women, it's, it's easy to make it maybe a little too pretty, a little too soft, mm. more like romance. I mean, no, not a rom-com necessarily, but um, because, I mean, relationships are important in books like this. But I think um, I think too often men get the credit for being physically brave and, mm. you know, good for Saffron that, um, that she has that, um, she takes that risk. I really like that. Yeah. It's a very, a very meaningful part of, of your book so yeah. I, other, other feedback 
about it. We can't really talk about what it is, but um, you have in the way well, of I, had, I had one reader who was incredibly helpful tell me that um, Saffron was maybe being a little too stupid to live, which I think is fair feedback <laughs> in that case. Um, but I mean, people, people love that Saffron is um, willing to take risks for those that she cares about. And they also love that she makes mistakes. And that's, that's probably my favorite thing about Saffron is that she makes questionable choices at times. And sometimes they're because um, she just wants to find the answer. She's a scientist, she's like finding the answer and putting together puzzles is her thing. Um, and so she is eager to do that sometimes um, in an unsafe way. But she also learns from it, which is, I think, really what we see in uh, Flowers and Fatality is that she has grown and changed as a person. She's still, you know, out there like investigating murders when she does not trained or qualified to do that, but she is going about it in a slightly smarter way this time. Um, I, I don't say in the, like the smartest way because the smartest way would be not to investigate a murder, um, but you know, that's, that's like what she feels called to do. Um, because she sees an injustice and she sees a wrong that she feels she can help right. And she, she wants to do that. So that's one of the things that I like about her. Oh, there are many things I like about her, but let's remember too, that you're in really early days of forensic medicine. I mean, sorry, you know, forensics in general. And yeah. I mean, there were undoubtedly hundreds, thousands of deaths by poison that were not detected because they're, you know, over centuries. Uh, because we really, that really weren't the tools to do that, or maybe the inclination to do it. I read an incredible nonfiction book uh, last year. I think it's by Deborah Bloom, Deborah Blum. I'm not sure how to say her name, um, but I think it's called The Poisoner's Handbook mm -hmm. or something like that. And it's that all about um, the, like the development of like forensic medicine and they spend a lot of time on poison so obviously like I saw Poisoner's Handbook and I'm like well this is mine I'm reading this and I really treat it like a little bit of a, a bible I have lots of markings because it's incredibly helpful for me as a writer but for me just learning about the process of like how how they developed all of these things and the incredible amount of time and concentration and just like relentless pursuit of science that these people had. It was a very small group. And I mean, people were doing it all over the world, but this particular book focuses on how they developed it in New York City in the, in the teens and the twenties and the thirties. And it, it was just incredible. And so after reading that, I'm like, I understand why, why poisoning was so popular, <laughs> like through the 1800s into the 1900s, because it was so hard to detect exactly. and to like make a case for. And it mimicked real illness. I mean, you know, our, mm -hmm. you know, largely mimicked, you know, stomach illness or whatever it was. And without a really decent test for arsenic, I think lots of deaths were written off, um, you know, and then also because people didn't have like pharmacies to go to, sometimes people accidentally poisoned themselves. Again, mm -hmm. you know, as we were saying earlier, because um, there wasn't any real standards about, I mean, easily available standards yeah. about dosage and so forth so that reminds me there's a really great uh Poirot um where the the person dies because they didn't shake up their like nightly tonic and all this strychnine had floated to the bottom and they took the last dose and they died because they didn't shake it up every day so I mean it's stuff like that like and not to mention that they they gave people crazy stuff like cocaine was like a medicine right for a long time uh, and they, that's actually mentioned in Flowers and Fatality because there is a, a cocaine connection and they talk about a little bit about the history of how it eventually became regulated like after the war and like during the war and all that kinds of stuff. It's just so fascinating. I could just talk forever about it because it, it's so cool. <laughs> and I guess that's, that's what makes me like the person who decided to write these books is because I, I hear about this and I'm like, okay, well, that is fascinating and I want to write about that. Well, you know, if you were to go to Cusco, let's say in Peru, when you walked into the major hotels, what you would find is they're giving you cocaine in the lobby because um, they have coca tea that they brew mm -hmm. for you because it helps your system acclimate to the higher altitude. 
um, you know, it's a stimulant. So yeah, it's, it's, again, they use it like medicine, right? Well, it is medicine. It's exactly right. But then again, as you point out, if you overdo it, you know, there you are. But anyway, um, all of that aside, the, I think the really interesting thing about Saffron is the way that she is carving out a role for her in a um, for, in a place in a professional uh, milieu that is not friendly to women. So in this book, she is going to start on her first research study, or the British say research. They don't say research, so we have to get it right. Her first research study alongside the insufferably charming Dr. Michael Lee. I love that phrase. So why is he insufferably charming? Why isn't he just a jerk like the rest of them? Well, he's charming and he knows it. Um, and we all know that kind of person who, you know, they are they are peacock and they they love being like handsome and charming and whatever. Um, but the reason why Lee is not 100% a jerk is because he he is a doctor. He's a medical doctor um, that Saffron has been paired with on her first study. And um, he loves being a doctor. He is passionate about it. Uh, and so we get to see his positive traits right away because the opening scene is there at um, the scene of a poisoning. And so um, we know that he cares desperately about his patients, um, even though he is willing to like flirt and laugh, you know, kind of on the sidelines, he, he cares about his science just like Safran does. Um, and then as we get further into the book, we, we see him start to understand what it's like for her at the university. And he starts to understand that there's a reason why with him, she's kind of tight-lipped and snarky um, instead of, you know, falling at his feet like all the other women do. And it's because life is really hard for her as a woman at the university. And so, um, I don't know, we, we see him have his own little arc of understanding through the book. And so that's part of the reason why I love him. Uh, he's really fun to write, but he's also like, he's a decent guy underneath all the, the charm and the smiles. What's the romantic interest in the first book? Alexander Ashton. And he right. comes back to play in this book as well. Right, because he's he's off stage. He's like off in the Amazon um, mm -hmm. or returning from the Amazon as it starts. So, you know, Mary Stewart, who wrote absolutely wonderful books of romantic suspense. I mean, she was absolutely brilliant 50 years ago and more of those books were huge. She always had, she always had two men and one woman classic and, love triangle well it was now it was a little different because she was writing romantic suspense and so the puzzle for the reader uh, she was great on um you know countryside she even did a lot of flora a lot of botany a lot of history a lot of other stuff but the crux of the plot was always going to be which of them was the true guy and which of them was a wolf in disguise so to speak and you know you the reader mm. had to try to work out uh, which one of them to trust or which one of them, you know, she was going to eventually um, be able to trust. And so it's always interesting when you bring in not your guy from Brazil right back, you know, to start <laughs> to introduce the insufferably charming Dr. Michael Lee. So now there are potentially two suitors in play should Saffron actually have time for romance. <laughs> <laughs> That's a very good point. Girl's really busy, so yeah. I don't know. I don't know what she's gonna do to to find time for these guys. That's a good point. Um, but yeah, I mean, it it was not like a plan to to have these two guys. But the more I got to know Lee, the more I understood that like he has some things that he could offer Saffron that um, Alexander also offers, but maybe struggles with as well, which we see when he comes back from. The Amazon. He is in this book, by the way, in case you're wondering. I have a lot of people who have been asking because they love Alexander. And right. yes, he does come back. Excellent. Well, and the other, you know, problem that Saffron would be facing was that, you know, people who married back in this time and, you know, had sex, otherwise why get married, um, and therefore often got pregnant, um, you know, that could put paid to a profession or it could create a whole question about, you know, child care and whether you can put yourself at risk. I mean, that's been a chronic problem with women investigators mm -hmm. in the amateur sleuth level is, you know, what's the morality of a woman with young children or a baby um, putting herself at risk investigating crime? 
So well, you, you, I've, that's I've a whole thing she might not want to do. Hmm? Yeah, I've I've really thought about that because I think about, you know, where where is where are these saffron books gonna go? Where is it gonna go with whoever, whichever guy she ends up with? Um, but yeah, I mean those are but those are questions that I want her to struggle with and I want her to grapple with is is but also as a scientist, right? Her career will will be impacted when you're um, you know, a researcher, researcher. Um, you have names on a paper. And if you got married in the 1920s, there was no hyphenating. There was no keeping your maiden name. You were going to take your husband's name. So any credit that S. Everly would get would, would change to whoever she ends up with. So that's something that she's going to be thinking about. That's true. The Married Women's Property Act did not protect you in that respect. Um, you know, there, I mean, there was... I think I'm trying to remember if Britain didn't enact the Married Woman Property Act before the Seneca Falls and the Married Women mm. Property Act here in this country. I'm, I'm not sure when they everything. did, but I'm just talking about like her her name, like in her professional. Oh, I know you are, but that's an extension is what yeah. I'm thinking yeah. here. It's kind of an extension of the Married Women's Property Act is that even if women gain the right to, you know, own their own their own stuff and their own income and so forth, as you point out. Um, people did give up their their maiden names and therefore mm -hmm. uh, there wasn't really any way to continue that. I mean, that's an interesting point I hadn't thought about. So I thank you for bringing that up. No problem. <laughs> no, it is. So what is the research project that Saffron is undertaking? Um, so started? she she and Lee have been assigned a like a series of case studies in which they are attending like local poisoning. So they get a report of a poisoning um, and they immediately go to wherever it's happening, kind of in the, the very like local London and like, you know, maybe like an hour or two outside of London. Um, and Lee goes as the doctor and he uh, can help with the treatment, but also he's getting like blood samples and things to see how it affects them. And then Saffron is in charge of finding the culprit if they don't know what it is and then getting the plant samples. Um, and we find out late in the book why they're doing this and, and who gave them this assignment. So I won't give that away, but um, it's basically just a series of case studies where they are documenting local poisons and really carefully documenting their effects. Because um, even at this time, I mean, we've had like, you know, thousand years or more of like written botany texts, but um, you know, there's very little information like concrete kind of guidebooks about what like poisonous plants do, like consistently do, what are the toxins and all that kind of thing. So that's kind of, they're making kind of like a catalog or a database of that. Got it. So in order to be a successful amateur sleuth, you have to have some actual police person, somebody with policing powers involved. Mm -hmm. It isn't going to be Safford and Dr. Lee because they are not in law enforcement. So who, in fact, is Detective Inspector Green and what role is he playing? Detective Inspector Green. He's He is the kind of long-suffering detective who I feel like when I picture him, I really picture Foil from Foil's War. Like, just like, you look mm -hmm. at him and you're like, you're kind of tired. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, you know what you're doing, but you're tired because, you know, he's he's involved in crime in a big city and, and he's in charge of solving it. So um, he's kind of the, the older, almost mentor kind of, uh, kind of guy. In the first book, he was more, not quite, like, he wasn't like a menace, right? Because obviously he's trying to solve a murder. Um, but he, they had much more of an antagonistic relationship um, right. because Saffron was doing things that she was not supposed to do. So in this book, he has come to her and asked her to consult. And then she gets kind of overexcited and says, I will solve this crime. <laughs> and so she goes off with Lee and she's working to to use their connections in in society to solve the crime. Um, but yeah, he's he's just kind of like old hand at at crime solving. 
And uh, we also get to see um, Sergeant Simpson comes back, who is kind of it's a little bit like a puppy following the inspector around um, and uh, tripping over things. But yeah, so I mean, we get we get kind of the best of both worlds. We get a bumbling sergeant and we get like an actual decent police officer. Well, we have to have him, um, you know, all the golden age mysteries. There was always, you know, Miss Marple had her nephew. Um, Poirot had Inspector Jap, you know, Conan Doyle, Sherlock Holmes had mm -hmm. a um, You know, there has to be, as I said, there has to be for enthusiastic amateur sleuths are all well mm -hmm. and good, but there has to, at the end of the day, there has to be somebody with the legal authority to, um, you know, to deal with things. With, yeah. with Poirot, I'm trying to remember, his his buddy is, is Colonel Hastings, but who's- Yeah, Hastings. But he's the, he's the bumbling one for sure. Although Jap also is kind of bumbling at times. Right. Yeah. But anyway, so it's a it's a dual thing. And uh, you may not remember this, Kate, because you're younger. But back in the 90s, there was a huge movement called the Woman Sleuth Movement, which was powered by Sue Grafton and Sarah Peretsky and Marsha mm -hmm. Muller and whatever. Um, and basically what they were was private investigators, private eyes. Um, and you know, solving cases. But again, there always had to be, and it was usually male, though it didn't actually have to be because there were women in law enforcement at that point. But there always had to be somebody who could actually, in the end of the, you know, at the end of the whole thing, arrest somebody. Yeah. And, slap know, the cup them off. So, you know, that that constant thing. I mean, all amateur sluice books really do need a professional at some point, a professional mm -hmm. law enforcement person or justice is never going to happen unless you decide that the amateur sleuth is just going to be a vigilante and, you know, execute whoever it might happen to be. Yeah, <laughs> I don't see true. Saffron doing that personally. No, no, and it kind of goes against, you know, if the amateur sleuth, the idea of the amateur sleuth is, you know, also the executioner doesn't really play very well. So, um, yeah. so there we have Inspector Green. So, um, and by that time, by the 1920s, there was an established police force in England and in London. Um, if you're writing historical mystery in the Regency period, for example, which is having a renaissance, or as the British say, renaissance, um, <laughs> thanks to um, Bridgerton and whatever, mm -hmm. The police, there wasn't an official police force. You had Bow Street runners, but they were sort of quasi-professional and you had magistrates, but you didn't really have any actual formal police until the 1830s, so. Yeah, well, and even then, like it, it was not like good police. Like they were so corrupt that I think in the 1890s, 1880s, they had a, a big cleanup. Um, and maybe it was even later. I'm not really sure, but I've I've researched it just like a tiny bit yeah. um, for like a one liner that Simpson says at some point. But um, yeah, like they they had police, but like they weren't they weren't good. They weren't like real police until much, much later. And then today we have Call of Duty, which reminds us of just how corrupt modern police force actually is. So, yeah. you know, that's always been a problem. And in point of fact, the amateur sleuths are generally, there's no real stench of corruption around amateur sleuths. You know, you don't, I mean, True Saffron was a suspect in the first book, mm -hmm. although we knew she was innocent or otherwise, why would we be reading the book? But um, in general, the amateur sleuths get, a, you know, are not stigmatized with the thought of corruption. Yeah, and, well, it's because they're they're choosing because they have they have some kind of chip on their shoulder, some kind of motivation that they are choosing to do this thing. Um, whereas, you know, with police, like they, it's a job. I'm sure a lot of police officers like do it because they want justice, but it's also a job and they get a paycheck and that whole thing. But, but amateur sleuths or at least, you know, somebody like Saffron is usually sleuthing because they have some kind of expertise. Um, mm -hmm. You know, they're that too. like, um, a consultant um, in a way, if you want to look at it that way. And um, oftentimes, oftentimes they become engaged in whatever the case is because there's some personal stake. Somebody is at risk. Somebody they care about could even be themselves. Um, and so, you know, they're engaged in trying to um, 
to get to the real truth of, of the matter and not just sit back and accept an obvious verdict. You know, so there's a lot of motivations that, that go on. Um, what Are there any particular poisons that you can mention in this book or is it going to be spoilers if we talk about what's in play? I can't talk about the actual poisons, but I can talk about the bouquets um, because okay. the premise of the book is that um, the crime that Inspector Green has been tasked with solving um, involves several murdered women who have received bouquets. Um, and then he brings the bouquets to Saffron. He says, can you tell me anything about these? They might be a clue. And so she realizes that um, multiple of the flowers used and the plants used um, are dangerous. They're poisonous or uh, they'll cause like dermatitis or whatever on the hands or wherever. And so uh, digging a little deeper, she realizes that the, uh, the bouquets are actually sending a message and she decodes that message with like a vintage, like Victorian era choreography dictionary. Um, because of something Lee kind of says on a whim and she's like, wait, like that was a thing at some point. So she goes and she finds out that the bouquets have had, uh, they've been sending a message and the messages are um, kind of violent ones. And so they do realize that it's a clue. And so Saffron takes those clues and tries to figure out what they say um, about the murders. So we have like, Aconite makes a reappearance after the first book. Aconite was a part of that. And so we have that coming back. We have Foxglove, uh, which you mentioned, uh, did, uh, sorry, Digitalis earlier. Um, I actually have all of the flowers that are used in the bouquets on the bookmark. So if you're able to go in person to Poison Pen and you see a signed copy, it has a bookmark in it. And right. the bookmark lists all of the plants that are in the bouquets and their floriography meaning. So that's cool. <laughs> uh, and you can also find it, um, you can find those same things. Um, I don't remember the name of the book exactly. I think it's called, I think it's just called The Language of Flowers. And I found that online because um, I just Googled floriography dictionary. And that was the first one that I found. So if you are like me and wanna know more about floriography, um, the book that I used is Flowers, Their Language, Poetry, and Sentiment. It was published in 1870. Um, so anyway, if you're interested in floriography, that is a like a you know first first resource that you can see. Um, but floriography also is kind of having a renaissance. I've seen a lot of of bookstores are carrying floriography books now, which is really cool. It is cool. And yeah, it was a really big Victorian thing. It was a way to send messages. You know, it was a courtship thing. It was mm -hmm. a lover's language. You know, you could, um, a young woman could, you know, receive a bouquet, you know, send flowers and it could have, because of floriography, it could have a specific message in it. You know, I that's an interesting idea. I don't think that I've really thought about carrying. I know we have, um, you know, the language of poisons or whatever it was. We, what was the title we referred to earlier? Oh, the one you asked me too quick. I'm sorry, the one in old New York. Anyway, yes, that, you know, the- Oh, Dictionary. Poisoner's Handbook. The Poisoner's Handbook, thank you. Right, um, that, that in their um, Poison Pen Press, actually years ago, there was an Italian um, who put together a really interesting, I can't remember the title of it either, but, um, it was like a dictionary of poisons or, you know, something mm -hmm. similar. Um, and of course, then there's always the question of, you know, when people go to check out a book like that, are they just reading it for fun or is this going to be a how to do it maybe? <laughs> or, you know, that's what, that's what my husband says every time I buy one of these books. He's like, what right. are anybody who looks on our bookshelf is going to have questions and then I'll just point to like all my books on the bookshelf and I'm like there's the answer that's why we have all of these books about poisons and murder is because yeah. I write books about it well there are poison gardens and you know we we mm -hmm. I had someone in the store the other day um who actually has a poison garden and we were talking about it. I asked her if she had cool. a whole and she said, you know, because oleander is like hedging here. I mean, there are there are oleander hedges all over, uh, certainly all over Scottsdale, and I think all over Metro Phoenix, and they're beautiful. 
in the spring. I mean, the profusion of blooms and their gorgeous magenta and white and anyway, but very, very poisonous. And the woman with the poison garden said that she didn't use, she didn't want oleander because it was so, uh, not just the flowers, but I think the wands, whatever it all is. Anyway, it was too dangerous. Yeah. Well, um, and it, it poisons um, honey. Like if bees uh, yes. it take too much on from it, then the honey can become poisonous. That's exactly right. That's it's also very bad for pets. I mean, if you have, you know, yeah. but there are other, even cacti, we had um, one of our puppies went leaping into the um, pencil cactus, for example, no. and the sap of it is just uh, harsh enough that he got his, it burned his eye. He had mm -hmm. a, I mean, it didn't kill him, but uh, so we had to rush him to the midnight vet, you know, to have his oh, eye. God. You know, and, yeah, and he had to wear the cone and, you know, it was horrible. <laughs> uh, so we we dug up the pencil cactus because he liked jumping into it and we put it in a yeah. pot where he can't reach it. So, I mean, there are, there are many hostile plants that maybe aren't directly poisonous, but um, in their own defense, particularly cacti. Yes. Um, have um either you know vicious thorns or or you know dangerous sap or whatever it might happen to be just as kind of a defense for the plant itself but you know gardening is such a british thing um and i think there are poison gardens all over britain um and you know yeah, yeah i mean yeah it, a lot of it. I visited, um, I went to London in October. Um, and I went, I mean, I went to a lot of places related to the, to my books. I went to the university college campus and I went to Kew Gardens, which was incredible. But I also went to, there's this little tiny garden in Chelsea. It's called the Chelsea Visit Garden. And it is, I think it's either the oldest apothecary garden in Europe or in England. I'm not really sure which one but just this little tiny garden and it's beautiful, but it is chock full of poisonous stuff because I mean, I feel like this is the point we keep coming back to. It's that like all things poison can also be medicine. Right. Yeah. But it was really fun. Cause they, even though it was very late in the season, they still had like some aconite blooming. They had like foxglove and all this other kind of, um, kind of stuff. But yeah, I mean, oleander is one I think about all the time. We have a guy on our street who has oleander um, growing. And every time we pass by it, I tell my son, who is now four, don't touch that. That's poisonous. Every time we go to the gardening section at, at Home Depot or Lowe's, I say, don't touch that. Don't touch that. Don't touch that. Um, just because I've, I've learned so much from researching these books that there's literally poisonous stuff everywhere. It really is. You know, if you have dogs, for example, you have to learn that poinsettia mm -hmm. um, and geranium are um, very bad for dogs. So, you know, if you're at Christmas, you have to really think seriously about um, whether you want to have like a floor stand poinsettia, you know, if you have mm -hmm. puppies and stuff. So not not all poisons are poisonous to all things, you mm -hmm. know, you have to Keep that in mind. Well, let's wind up by talking about book three. I, I always like asking if, in fact, there's a new book. But since you brought it up, obviously there is going to be a new book. So how is yeah. it? Yeah, it's it's very exciting, and we actually just signed uh, with Crooked Lane for a fourth book um, right. for 2025. So there's more saffron and more poisons coming. But uh, yeah, book three. Book three is going to be a little bit different. Um, we're we're moving to a different research facility. Saffron is still at the university, but she's gonna see another research facility um, with some women there, which will be fun for her. But um, I, I just don't even know what to say about this book. It's so much fun. <laughs> um, there's brothers involved. We get to see Alexander's um, brother is involved uh, in the book. Elizabeth's brother is gonna be in that book as well. So very interesting family relationships and family dynamics. So we get to, we get to know everybody a lot better because we get to see more about their families, which is really fun. So for a person who just sort of wondered if she could write a mystery, you've certainly taken to this like as the proverbial duck to water. Yeah, it, it was really like turning on a hose and then uh, just like a geyser erupted instead. Um, I've always really loved reading and writing, but I never thought that I would be a writer like professionally but I just 
I don't know. I have so many ideas and so little time. So I'm excited to keep going. Well, that's wonderful news. I certainly have enjoyed both your books. And I meant to tell you that we have a the Arizona Herb Society's 10th anniversary meeting at the Poison Pen this coming Sunday. And one of our staff is um, put together a uh, bibliography and assembled um, a bunch of books, you know, to talk about. And so our few remaining signed copies are part of this. Um, so That's it'll be it'll be interesting. <laughs> He's going to spread the word among the actual herbalists. About I know, but see, books. now I'm scared because my greatest fear is that I've made a mistake and some gardener somewhere is going to be like, uh-uh, that's not what actually is going on. <laughs> I'm sorry, you can refer them back to Dorothy Sayers. <laughs> she managed it very, very well. True. And, um, well, Bob Patrick, come join us. While you are um, looking for questions online or something, I'm going to look up the Dorothy Sayers book when in fact she got it all wrong. Yeah. Now, I when I first started um, kind of when I returned to reading, I took like a lot of people, I got really turned off of reading in high school and college because I wasn't into the literature that they made us read. Yeah. Uh, and so I came back to it and I, I read like all the Franny Fisher books. I read a lot of Tasha Alexander and I read like 15 or 20 of the Corolla Dunn Daisy books. Um, but I haven't read them like in years. So now I'm like, did I read that one? I don't remember. There's a new Franny Fisher book coming out this year by Carrie. Yay, which is great. And Tasha will be with us on October 22nd. And Lady Emily and Colin have gone to Egypt. So that'll be- I love the travel books are the best. I love travel books. I I love like the the Poirot's where he goes to like, um, like there's like Death on the Nile and Murder in Mesopotamia. Like those are my favorites. They're so much fun. Well, just mark down October 22nd and you'll be able to watch Tasha talk about that. Patrick, are there any questions? Um, there are some nice comments. Um, you know, how cool that she uses Victorian flower symbolism to solve the mystery. Oh. Um, Robin says, I'm listening to Diana Gabaldon's uh, eighth book where Claire is visiting a huge garden outside Philadelphia. There's a ton Ooh. of plant information in that in, in her books, yeah. Uh, to do. There it is. All right. It's the documents in the case. I knew I could find it. Documents in, in the case. The documents in the case by Dorothy Sayers. Um, it's without Peter, with without Lord Peter. Oh, okay. right, right. I was then, getting um, my authors mixed up. Yep. Uh, a noted expert on fungi, fungi is found dead after digesting poisonous mushrooms. So it's mycology that was in play. There's yes. a there's a world of accidental poisoning because you don't know your mushrooms. Yeah. You, know, you can easily I actually we're, we uh, we are going to see some mycology in Safra number three, which is very amusing to me because she has to consistently tell someone I'm not a mycologist. It is not the same thing. <laughs> right, and as I understand it, that particular poisonous mushroom, the name of which, of course, I can't fully remember, there is no way to reverse it if you eat it you're dead. Um, there isn't any Love way. That. There's no way to fix it when it happens to you. So, um, you know, there are a lot of plants that have psychedelic properties too. There sure they? are. Yeah. And, and yeah. cacti, suc- succulents. Yeah. Ooh, see, um, that's dangerous because succulents and cacti are so tempting when you're in desperate need of water. Right. Grab the wrong the wrong one. Yeah. <laughs> Some peyote it's, and who knows where you're gonna go. And what is it that didn't um didn't Oregon just agree that people could take magic mushrooms? I think they just legalized um, you know, psychedelic mushrooms, if I remember this right. Like recreationally? Yeah, I think so. Um okay. well it might be medicinally, but I think recreationally. I mean, you know, states are moving into cannabis as right. Re- I mean, Arizona you know, has made it legal. Um, and um, I think whatever this is in Oregon, I'm pretty sure I'm right. I'll look it up. Um, Oregon, that's you know, the great thing about having a phone. There's hardly anything you can't look up. Um, that Oregon. Um, the toads secrete that, you know, um, what is it you can, I can't remember the name of the 
is it Bufo, something like that, that, that those crazy kids are all doing these days? Um, that's <laughs> looking that's at one, toad and one mystery that I think uh, Saffron will not be investigating. That um, one right here. Alexander might though. Alexander is a biologist, so maybe that no, maybe right. he can bring that up. Okay, Oregon approves the final leak in the legal psychedelic mushroom pipeline um, on May 23rd. They are officially the first state in the nation with a functioning legal system to obtain and use psilocybin. So, you know, who knows how much. Um, well, I mean, also the whole notion of microdosing, I think, has, has really been helpful in a lot of medicinal applications. Yeah. I mean, not just tripping, you know, but for different things. Right. Well, yeah. cannabis is known to relieve um, a lot of pain for cancer patients and people right. with other you know, and the, the CBC stuff, um, you know, external applications are great for arthritis and other kinds of things. Um, so, you know, it's interesting that in a way, you know, we're kind of moving back to the old, um, mm -hmm. you know, herbal, um, herbal remedies and so forth that our ancestors depended on. In fact, reading about Lisa C's book, Lady Tan, which I mentioned to you, which is absolutely fabulous, some of the medicines and practices that Lady Tan is using in the Tang Dynasty are still in practice in China today. So, you know, their efficacy has lasted for centuries. Um, so it isn't all. In fact, as I understand it, too, there's a constant sort of looking in the Amazon for stuff, you know, that in whatever parts of the rainforest still exist, um, which might turn out to have miraculous powers for um various ailments so yeah the plants but also um like the i mean the fungi in particular i think are of most interest to them yeah. uh, at the moment and they're realizing like i mean how like i don't know like 40 percent of the rainforest has been destroyed or something like that and now they're saying well that's you know hundreds of thousands of of organisms that we could have used for, yeah. for medicine and so like how much how many remedies for cancer have been destroyed and things like that or conversely how much has been let loose on the world that you know was previously locked up in the rainforest so there's the dark side to that as well yeah. and that's going to be true as glaciers melt i mean i i know i read something and i can't remember if it was real or if it was part of a mystery or something but um under the permafrost in siberia something thawed out and whatever the plague germs were that mm -hmm. you know, had been frozen there have come to life so you know there i've definitely read i think that might be in um white out i think i there's a, a yeah. romantic thriller that I read like last summer, the summer before when it was really hot and I wanted something cool to read, um, where they had, they had found some kind of germ or bacteria like in, in the ice when they drilled down. And so these big bads like came to steal it and sell it basically. But I feel like this is also something that's actually happening in the world and not just in romantic thrillers. Well, I think it's actually possible. And another big question is, you know, in, in former plagues, they people were buried in plague pits because there was no way to deal with, you know, hundreds or thousands of bodies and all. And so a real question is, has any of that bacteria survived um, buried in there in the plague pit? And, you know, if it thaws out or whatever it might be, is it going to leap out again? And, you know, so there, you know, we're, you're so right that the whole question with all of this comes back to balance, you know, the good part, the benefits as opposed to the dangers and, you know, deficits of, of the floral world. Yeah. And it's, it's a great metaphor for, you know, mystery writers is that like every, everyone has positive characteristics, but any, any characteristic when there's too much of it is going to cause problems. So. Absolutely true. Well, it's been a joy to talk to you again, Kate. Mom, one of these days you must come and see us. I want to so bad. Are you kidding? <laughs> well, I, the, I mean, the, the name of the bookstore alone. It, well, of it course, makes that it would incredibly tempting to right? for me. <laughs> I'm actually toying with putting together a little a little thing with Tasha um, at that weekend in October because there's a new Jane Austen, a final Jane Austen mystery. Um, mm. Scott Harris has another, maybe you know, a little historic on as we call it. 
So if I get the oh, yes, um it would be, you know, maybe half a dozen authors and we could do like a whole afternoon. So I'll stay in touch because it's the shame we haven't had a chance to meet you, even though I've really enjoyed our two Zoom sessions. So here we go. Um, a botanist guides to floral and fatality, which we have autographed in the paperback of a botanist guide to parties and poisons is just out. So that'll give you a chance to get started on this wonderful series. Say so thank you, Kate, for your time. And thank you for watching us. Bye. Thank you. You bet.